So with that said, I will introduce Chris White, and I'm not going to read you his bio, but I will put the link to it in the, well, actually, I don't know if we have it on our website, but I could send it out to everybody after also. But it's a long, long bio because he's done a lot of really amazing things, but I will say, Chris and I go way back. We do. I have been to several of his sessions for Lean Six Sigma. And I think white belt, maybe yellow, but I think just white belt. That was, that was maybe as far as my brain could take me. But, <laughs> but he's worked with cities in Texas and beyond to implement everything from small scale changes to help improve processes or efficiency, but also all the way to doing full-blown Six Sigma black belt training. So he is certainly an expert and super duper smart. I think probably the first three times I ever talked to Chris, I said, Chris, I'm going to need you to dumb it down for me a little. <laughs> Just bring it down to my level so I can digest this. But he's good about doing that too. And so always a joy to learn from and listen to. And so I hope that you all will enjoy what he has to say, but also, like I said, feel free to ask your questions and hopefully, you know, get something out of this today. So Chris, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, well, thank you very much. That was, that was a glowing introduction and, and overview. I, I appreciate that. And this is so informal. I don't really have a presentation planned so we can talk, but I'll, I'll talk about some of the things that, that I have done, but, but let me, let me start with just asking, we've got a few people on the, on the call here. Have y'all done any, we use the term Lean Six Sigma, but it's really just process improvement or continuous improvement. Have any of your cities been trying to do or successfully done or in the middle of any kind of process improvement type of efforts? We'd love to hear. Everyone's on mute. So if anyone's talking, I'm uh, not here. Do you want to answer? She raised a hand. So here at the city of San Jose, we've actually worked with a vendor. Um, the name of slips me, but the speaker's his name is Brian Elms, and he has got something called the Innovation Academy. And basically, like trying to find bottlenecks in your processes at work, and trying to fix them with no money involved. And mm -hmm. so, kind of like what's under your specific control, troubleshooting it and identifying alternative ways of how you can like clean up the process, um, mm -hmm. without spending any additional money. Well, fan okay. fantastic. That's great. Now, I think that, Chris, because I think it was, Estraya, your voice, you're very, very soft. And I wasn't sure if it, I was trying to turn up my volume because I thought it might have just been on my end. But Kat mentioned that in the chat. So do you uh, want to recap that a little bit, Chris, or, or I can if not? I'll let her take a shot at it. I see her putting on a, a headset, which might be a little bit better. Perfect. Well, while she's messing with cords. So so she says she's working with a company, uh, Innovation Academy, I think is what she said out there in San Jose where they are trying to make some some process improvements. And I'll I'll say this, you know, I see some comments that we're looking to do and we haven't, you know, we're trying some or thinking about it and we haven't done it yet. The, you know, a lot of times when you use the term Lean Six Sigma, people associate that with manufacturing and and and, and they get scared when it comes to trying to do things in a, in a city. So what we try to do is work at all levels, kind of meet the city where they are in terms of terminology, maturity, what they've done before. And so like Chris was saying, we've done very, very simple, real small, you know, small wins, just looking for little improvements here and there, as well as big overarching cross-functional attacking the whole development process, you know, something that can take many, many months. And we're trying to shave, you know, 30% time off that and reduce that cycle time. But the, the great thing is, whether any of these process improvements, it's all about processes. So wherever there's a process, you can do some kind of improvement. It doesn't have to be manufacturing anything. I've, I've done stuff within the local governments, federal governments, financial sector, defense sector, health sector, anywhere there's a process, this kind of stuff can be done. And so there really can be very simple techniques, but, but Chris sort of alluded to being very technical. She actually said I was smart, which I appreciate, but there can be some heavy math when you get really into it. So whatever your appetite is, there's plenty of opportunity for different tools and techniques to use whatever level of maturity and whatever appetite you are. So I've worked with some cities where we haven't even said Lean and Six Sigma, we just call it process improvements. I've worked with other cities where they are they are advocates for trying to do Lean Six Sigma and they want to use the terminology. And so we do that as well. And we actually have training courses. And if you've ever heard the term, Chris mentioned white belt, yellow belt, there are all these belts that tend to, Six Sigma tends to follow karate 
and uses a belt structure that sort of goes up and it represents you, you're sort of more mature or elevated in the field. And so there's that option as well. And so the training and the improvements that, that I've worked with cities, and it's probably been, Chris, I was looking and it's about 15 or 16 cities in Texas and outside of Texas that I've worked with at various levels. And some of that involves training. Soraya, you mentioned that y'all are working with this academy. Was training part of that or is this just a facilitator coming in? Did y'all actually get people trained as well? Yeah. So the facilitator comes in, does like a three-part series, walking over the steps and giving us like projects so that in between the sessions, then we apply whatever we're learning and then we present to the class what we ended up doing. Fantastic. How's that worked for you? Yeah, it's worked out. Most of the people who have gone through the program were like, yeah, this is great. And, you know, of course, you have to get the supervisors in for it as well. <laughs> yeah. That um, is so that you can make those changes. Yeah, that's a, uh, there are a couple of sort of things that need to be in place to to make these successful. It's it's always fun for people that that take the classes and, and learn the stuff. They're all excited and they want to make the changes. And then when they have some levels of management or upper management not involved or or not as excited and, and therefore not quite as supportive, that can often kill the kill the effort. So it's very important that that, you know, at all levels of of your organization, everyone is involved and excited and has a chance to see it so that it can be maintained. Because the worst thing to do is go through I mean, it's not just process improvement, it's anything. You go through a training class class and if no one ever mentions it again and doesn't care about it, it it drops, it dies. And so same thing applies here. And I'm a big advocate for doing the training also, because as a consultant myself, personally, I don't like to, I mean, I like helping cities, but I don't want the city to rely on me for improvements to happen. So what I like to do is build capacity at the, at the city or whatever organization I'm working with, to make sure they have people that are, that have the skills and more what I'm doing is teaching the skills and then mentoring those people on how to start to apply them, grow them in their maturity, and then hopefully walk away and they keep, they keep going. So, so I see Chris is asking about projects that, that I've implemented, but before I go on, are there any questions on what I've talked about so far? I have one question if nobody else does, but I want to give other people a chance to ask, but it looks like everybody's still muted. So I'm going to assume that means they're going to rely on me to be the question asker. Um, Okay. Chris, just curious, and this is with no answer in mind either, but generally when people are looking at implementing some type of process improvement, Mm -hmm. is it stemming from like a need to reduce expenses or a need to improve service delivery? You know, like what's the underlying motivator for something like that? It's generally been that someone has complained, a citizen or a developer, or someone came to the city council or to the mayor. And now the mayor's, you know, whoever that city representative is, is now coming back to city management and saying, hey, we're getting complaints that there are issues. This is taking too long or something happened. So a lot of times it ends up being more a symptom than anything. So, um, you know, a developer comes and says, hey, this is an important project. And, and they happen to have the ear of the a city council member. So they go tell them, hey, get me through the process faster. And, and it ends up exposing once that happens, that oh, okay, well, we've got some. What what really happened right here? Let's do some digging. Wow, okay, we you know we missed that in the process. We didn't have a catch guard to make sure that this was handled or this was followed up or this happened. And so uh, that that's a lot of times what it ends up being is that someone has it's it's usually not a budget it's issue. Or, yeah, it ends up saving money and saving time and all that. But that's not. It's usually a complaint from. Okay. Uh, you know, a, a a citizen or or a business or something that that initiates it. That makes sense. Yeah. So um, one of the projects, uh, kind of in that development world, I worked with South Lake on the city of South Lake in Texas on their development process. I'm also working with Bernie. And I've worked with some other cities. That tends to be an area that a lot of cities want to sort of you know streamline a little bit better. So so that's been a good area to work in. But in that, for example, and this is just general process stuff. So I'm just talk in any kind of process, but with a process, you know, what you'd like to do is you've got steps in the process and nothing moves through to the next step if it's not correct, if it doesn't have everything it needs. So if you've got, if I've got some package that I'm supposed to pass along and it's supposed to have 10 documents in it or 10 different plans, Mm -hmm. then I shouldn't pass it along till I see all 10 plans and they're of adequate quality or whatever. 
So a lot of what we do is is really just very straightforward stuff. Even though there's a lot of techniques and terminology for it that's in this Lean Six Sigma world, but it's really basic stuff of, hey, don't let trash and incomplete stuff move through the process. Stop it where you can. Stop it as soon as you can, because anytime something is incomplete or half-baked and it starts going through the process, all it does is cause problems later. So what's very interesting is that in in the city's attempt to be very customer service oriented and make the customer happy, what they do is sometimes move people along in a process to make that person happy, make them think they're making progress. They move them along, even though the discipline of the process says you really shouldn't move along and it's just going to cause problems later on. And so in their attempt to have better customer service, they actually end up creating worse customer service because later on there's a bigger problem and it takes even longer to solve. And it's always either easier to solve them up front. And so anyway, it's, it's very interesting. Everyone's got the best intentions, but even with the best intentions, we can sometimes cause, cause our own problems. So. Is it common for you to get into it? You know, like it, say an organization calls you, they say, we had a complaint about this process that's too lengthy or taking too long, or they weren't, you know, we weren't delivering good customer service. And so you get in there and it's, like you you uncover a different problem that they didn't anticipate. Absolutely. That definitely happens a lot of times because we end up, the, the larger the process, the more people you kind of bring in because it becomes cross-functional. Some processes are very isolated. So you're within a, a group, but let's, let's keep with this development process where there's multiple groups obviously involved. And so we're all around the table talking and you begin to hear, you, you don't realize sometimes how siloed and separate you are in an organization. You really think you're collaborative and all that, but you don't realize things are happening and you're not seeing everything. And so a lot of times we start with one issue. And as we talk about it, we see that it sort of has these fingers, these tentacles that go out into other areas and are touching other things and and, and are causing problems elsewhere that that before we never thought that was even there, but it took that discussion. It took that, that cross-functional approach, everyone kind of coming together with a, an attitude of listening and trying to understand. And you get that and you get those people around the table and you, you do end up uncovering a, a lot more than what was the initial problem. It usually just that initial complaint just starts you on the process. That makes sense. Any, uh, so I see, Amy, you said you're looking to ways ways to make improvements and are just trying to come up with some ideas. What have been some of the ideas and have people been forthcoming and excited to submit ideas? Because a lot of people are sometimes, if, if it's new, they're they're a little hesitant. So I'm curious to hear what y'all have done, if you don't mind answering. And I mean, if you're talking, you are on mute or if you don't want to talk, that's, that's fine. I get it. I was just, I was just seeing. I was typing. <laughs> One of the things that, uh, you know, obviously everyone's a little hesitant when it comes to, to new things. So we kind of implement things very slowly, but sometimes that, you know, that also hinders the process. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to look for ideas from others of how, you know, how you get people to engage and accept those changes without it being a disruption. Yeah, it it does. I'm there. If it's never been done before and it's kind of new, everyone is hesitant and it's a little bit scary and no one's sort of gone down that path yet. And we don't really know what it looks like and and all that. But as long as especially the the management, you know, so your your supervisors, your directors, your city management staff, as long as they are supportive and they know that part of their role is to to be supportive and to encourage that that goes a long way. I have had a lot of efforts where we've done a lot and the city manage the CMO, you know, city manager's office, for example, you know, after our big presentation, Soraya, you mentioned y'all, you know, did a presentation of, hey, we did this work. You know, after the big presentation of, hey, we, we did all this great work. And yay, that was great. We had a nice little breakfast, you know, nice little meeting and, and it was fun and invited everyone. They did their presentations and then it was crickets after that. And that is the worst, worst thing. And so I came back to that same organization and said, you know, the reason that happened is actually because of, of y'all. You, you never went around. You never asked questions. You never showed any kind of interest or support in what was happening. And so they took that to heart and we tried again. And we're in a second effort now, kind of a second wave coming through 
that looks to be a lot more successful because they have been involved and supported from the beginning. So it really, you need the combination of the the grassroots, the bottom up, because those are the people that are on the line that are that that want to make it happen, want to make those improvements. But you got to have that air cover and support from above. And so if you if you don't have that, I, I will admit it makes it very difficult. So I don't know if you've seen that, Amy, with with your situation and, and kind of what the level of acceptance or support is at various levels. But yeah, you bring up a very good point. It's funny, Chris, we were just talking about this this morning, so it's fresh, but you, and you might remember this, but at SGR probably plus years ago, we implemented a new CRM and it was, you know, we had full buy-in from the team. You know, we did, we worked through building out all of the automation, the workflows and all that. And of course it's a change and, you know, that's, it's hard to get people to change processes, even though it was a positive change or would have been a positive change, but it took one very influential leader, all team meeting saying, I don't know if this is going to work. And it was done. Wow. I mean, wow. killed it in its tracks. People quit using, nobody would use it. And, and so I, you know, I tell that story a lot, not to, not to point fingers at anyone on our team, but to say, you know, it just takes one, you know, somebody who's a leader and influential to say, I have doubts or whatever, you know, and then it, people gave up on it almost instantly. Oh, I can imagine. I bet they did. I bet they dropped like flies immediately. Sure did. <laughs> That's unfortunate. Well, in, in it's, it's, you know, I'm sure with that CRM, it's it's the same thing. But with some of these efforts, you've got a lot of training. You they have, people have put in a lot of time and blood and sweat and tears to figure stuff. You know, figure out improvements, make them happen, have the meetings, all that kind of stuff, and come up with something that really is good and they can show results. And then for it to die on the vine is just a such a huge demotivator that it makes it tough to come back around at some other point. You know, you only get a couple of shots at it. And if right. you, know, you what the, the crying wolf kind of thing, if you, you know, if, if I've tried it and you didn't support me and now you ask me to do it again, I, you know, my chances of trying to do it again and go out there and, and take that chance are a lot, a lot less. So, mm-hmm. so anyway, Amy, I don't know if you're seeing some of that, but hopefully y'all can work work through some of that. Hopefully you have the support of some of the, the leaders of the, the organization. What about Kat? Are you still in Azel? Let me give her a minute. Did you say Azel? She's in Azel. So here in Texas. Yeah, I think so. I, I, that's, I, if, I mean, this is by memory. So if, if I remember correctly, that's yeah. correct. I'm, I'm, okay. in Azel. I'm sorry. I, I, I stepped across to my generalist office. Did you ask something that you needed to respond to? No, I said, Kat, are you still in Azel? And then there was silence. So I was like, I could be wrong. I'm doing yeah. it. No, I'm, 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 I'm still, I'm still here. Yeah. You, you had left and come back, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Kat was one of my very first connections, like way <laughs> back. I mean, I'm not aging us by any means, Kat, but like uh, <laughs> probably almost 20 years ago, I think. Like, well, right. Yeah. I start, I'm in, I'm in my, I just crossed over 15 years. So yeah. that, that's about right. Yeah. Yeah. So we've worked so, together over the so years. Kat, I, I see you through, you know, when, when I asked earlier, if y'all have done anything, I see you say that y'all have not, as there, is there, uh, is it that there's not a desire to, or there haven't been complaints or what, what's, what's some it, of that? It just, it just is not something <clears throat> that has, has come up with us because as a lot of other areas in Texas, I mean, we've been growing, you know, by leaps and bounds and there's been, you know, lots of transitions. So the the areas that have been focused on haven't encompassed, you know, anything like Six Sigma. So, you know, that was a that was a curiosity on on my part, you know, to to hear about it. Um, because we've used we have used SGR for our city manager search. That you all helped us with our police chief, you know, search in some capacity. And so, it, and and heck, I had lunch with Ron Hollifield a couple of times in my first few years here. So, you know, it's obviously a very well-respected organization. And so it was just, I wanted to hear what, what others had to, had to say about it. What? So a little background. So I've, I've worked with, so SGR does the executive searches and, and leadership stuff. And before they were, uh, they were offering Six Sigma and process improvement kind of stuff. And I'm the one that helped them put all that together. So that's my background. And then they've moved away from that a little bit. And so I've just continued it on my, my own, but, but that background is, is still there, but we'll make a comment, not necessarily specific to, to you, Kat, or to, to Azel, but this, 
this, you know, when cities are growing, everything's going well, the money's there and it's easy, you know, everyone wants to be a part. And so it's, it's easy to have processes that are not perfect because everyone's willing to deal with them and everyone just wants to be part of the game and, and enjoy the ride. But it's also a great time to begin to put things in place that can scale. So when you are a bigger organization or a bigger city or whatever, these th- it's you don't go through the pain at that point in time of whoops. Now all of a sudden we have way too much, which I've I've had with a couple of cities is they they had a good ride for a while and then their processes were very immature and inadequate to handle the scale that they were starting to see. And most of this is de- a lot of this is development related, but you can imagine you know, any, any process, more citizens, bigger town, all this is now piling in. And so I I do encourage cities that even when it's not obvious that they need something to, you know, think ahead of, well, well, when we grow and we're, we're, we're larger and there's more, can we handle this kind of volume at the way we're doing this? And that's with any organization. It doesn't have to just be cities, but any organization when it starts and it's small, everyone's just doing whatever they got to do to make it work. And and it works. And then it, it gets bigger. But what made you succeed in the past of everyone just kind of attacking it is not necessarily the best way to succeed in the future. As you get, as the city grows and there's more activity, processes need to be put in place so that those processes are handling the work. And it's not just individuals handling the work and where you're relying on the individuals. You got to have processes that do all the heavy lifting for you and are disciplined and can be followed and are consistent and, and all that. So, so keep that in mind as you, you know, as y'all continue to grow. And I see Sor- Soraya had to drop, but. And what about Maria, where, where are you located? Hi. I am actually, I am actually at DFW airport. Oh, um, no. I work in the innovation department and most of our work is because of the huge growth that this airport is going to have to go through. Yeah. But when I was hired on, the reason being is it is a smart city and we are really trying to push that entity into the next phase of digitalization. Of The processes are extremely important. I agree with you, Chris, on that one. But I also wonder how we're trying to show leadership. Yes, but some of those processes are a little bit 20, 25 years old. And if we're going to move to this next level to meet an additional 10 million passengers coming in next year, how are those processes really going to change? And it does reflect back to your earlier comments about you get one leader that says, hey, that's not going to fly. So I am in this process of reviewing what needs to change? Where do we need to go? And how are we pitching that message? Well, and that's a, you've got an interesting, especially when you br- bring technology in, the worst thing we can do as an organization is to hardwire inefficient, terrible processes with technology. You know, we did it that way in the past and, and, you know, it seemed to work or whatever, but it's, but, and we're just going to lock that in or, or the technology says, we need to have a process that looks like this, even though we've never done it that way. It's very important to really design the processes and then the technology supports that process so that they're all, you know, working smoothly. But you're in a tough spot. I mean, it it it, it is difficult because a lot of times we want to implement that. And I say we just in a general sense, you know, we're excited to implement technology and see changes. But we often do that at the detriment of not having a process that is really mature and can support that technology. And so, so good luck with that. It's a, not easy. No, and I do feel it really operates similar to a city because we do have these siloed business units, right? We do have infrastructure and transportation. We do have operations. We have procurement. And we feel that sometimes bridging all of those silos and trying to see, is there a way we can work together for the better mm-hmm. betterment of the of the airport? I think that is a huge challenge for us right now. Yeah. And I think generally everyone wants to, it's, it's more a matter of, we don't know how, or we don't realize, and that's what I find I'll say on the personal. So there's all this process stuff, but there's, there's a, per, there's a people process that, you know, people, whatever you want to call it, maturity that goes through this as well. And that is that, um, you know, we all want to do well. We just don't realize how much we are standing in our own way 
by the way we are doing things or the way we are isolated. We don't realize we're isolating ourselves. We don't realize we're not sharing information. It's not like we're trying to sabotage anything or do purposely, you know, cause trouble. It's just that I've got my demands of, you know, pounding on me. So I'm doing what I can to survive. And it's hard to, you know, move on to something else. And and Kat, even I see in the comments brought something up of, you know, how, how can you, how can you be proactive when you're stuck in this reactive state and, and you can't, you can't get to that turning point. And I'll say this, it is just like with dieting or working out or something like that, there will be a little discomfort and pain to start with. Like the, you've got to go above and beyond for a portion of time to make some slight improvements to begin to buy yourself a little bit of wiggle room to be less reactive and more proactive. That's all there is to it. It doesn't happen. You don't get the lucky thing where, oh, all of a sudden yesterday I was, you know, in the, you know, swamp up to my, you know, butt and alligators kind of thing. And now everything's great. Never happens that way. And the only way is to prioritize and say, we've got to make this happen. We know for the long term, this is the best decision. So how can we begin to allocate time? And I've worked with some organizations on making sure that people have like 10% of their time. They can actually charge 10% of their time to this process improvement code or something like that. They are allowed to do that. Because what kind of kills people is when it's all expected above and beyond. I'm working 40 hours or 50 hours or whatever a week. And now you want me to do this and I got to make this improvement or, or do whatever. And, and it's tough. And so the, the best way is, is the commitment and then be able to say, we're going to purposely give you a slice of time that allows you to start making the changes that chip away at all that and, and begin to get us into a more proactive state but you know the ball's got to get rolling somehow and it just takes effort to get that ball rolling it's it's not an easy thing well, Maria, I, I see Maria nodding her head some so I'm sure she's hitting some of that as well oh absolutely and it is about messaging and it is about planning I mean that's one thing that especially being an innovation on the side of we've got to plan we've got to make sure that people are prepared and ready for what's coming down the pike. I know a lot of us were not ready for what happened a couple of years ago, and now we're not ready for people to be on the move like they are. But there have been a lot of changes, and I I don't want to be in that position of being reactive. I'd love to be in that position of, hey, we're going to preempt what we're going to do and how we're going to plan. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Krista. Were you going to say something? Yeah, I, thought... I was just excited because I had a meeting on Friday with Carolyn Eccles with the North Texas Innovation Alliance, and she was bragging on the on DFW Airport. And so it kind of made me happy to have an opportunity to share share that with you, talking about like the smart city initiatives in that area and how much like people are, you know, really committed to it in North Texas. And she said they took a group. I'm probably going to get the statistic wrong or the, the exact numbers wrong because I'm horrible with that. But they took a group to Barcelona. Are you familiar? Do, do you yep. know Barcelona? Okay. I know and, exactly what you're talking about. Yes. Into like the North Texas cities that went to Barcelona with this group represented like, I don't know, a crazy percentage of the total people who went from all over the world. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was like 34% or something. I mean, I don't know. I can't remember what she said. I'm afraid I'm probably way off because I can't remember. I just know it was very impressive. And I was like, no way. And she was like, yes, like North Texas cities like literally were the most represented group there. And I was like, that's so cool. It is, it is amazing. And you're seeing barriers come down. Yeah. I, I mean, people are getting out there and saying, okay, well, how can we make our city better? They're learning, knowledge portals are going up. I mean, it is extremely exciting what's happening right now. I love it. Mm -hmm. I, see, I waited until it was just North Texas people on the call to say that. That way I don't <laughs> <laughs> I'll yeah, that you don't want to attend to anybody. Post it. But I thought it was such a neat, I mean, like, and it's, there's a lot of pride in that of living in North Texas and being like, hey, look at us. You know, that's really cool. I don't know. So thanks for what you do. I'll, I'll add I'll add that in North Texas and, and really in most of the cities I, I deal with anyway, but the attitude has been really good. The, 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 the support and the desire to do some of this stuff. So there is smart cities and there's technology. They're making sure we're doing this, but they want a, you know, what they used to call HPO, high performing organ organization, you know, they want that and are dedicated to that. So when I've worked with some of those cities, it's been, it's been very easy from a, you know, consultant or facilitator standpoint, been very easy because there has been a lot of 
support and desire to make this better. And everyone's coming in there with, with that desire. And it makes those meetings, those workshops, the training that much easier and, and, and better to do that. So I, I give kudos to, to North Texas cities for, for that as well. Absolutely. It seems like there's a real mindset involved with a embracing technology and then also being willing to embrace process improvement. Like you kind of like, that's kind of a mindset in a way of just like embracing change, embracing improvement, being open. I don't know, constantly learning all of those kind of things, I guess that would go along with it. Well, I'll say this once you, once you have participated in a process improvement project, that actually works and you see a change and you see that change stay and is, is, you know, continues past the project is one of the most rewarding things. It is, is very exciting and it just gets you more excited to, to do that next one. So Kat, going back to your comment, it's the first one is the hardest, but boy, is it important. It's just begins to just chip away and that's all you got to do is get that first one under the belt and then they come easier after that. And everyone sees the results and you got that to build on and everyone's excited and, 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 but it, I'll admit it, it, it does take some, some work to start with and you got to have the support of upper management and you've, you've got to have some tools and techniques that you're using to make sure you're creating the right processes that are well, you know, defined, well disciplined, well controlled. And because I'm such a huge advocate of let the process do all the heavy lifting for you, let it do if you follow the process, you know, you ought to be good. If if you're dependent on people, that's what small organizations have to do. If you're dependent on, I need that person, I need Chris, I need Maria, I need Kat, then you're in trouble because when they're not there, that process falls apart or or that work doesn't get done. So having a process that enables or ensures all that continues is is mm-hmm. obviously I'm passionate. That's you know, that's what I do for a business. So well, and it seems like one of the keys, like, and correct me if I'm wrong, though, Chris, and it seems like based on this conversation, especially one of the key points here is to be able to document success or failure in that instance. But like, you know, to be able to to have the data driven or quantitative, you know, data to say this was successful or this was not successful. Yeah. In, in fact, that's a lot. When, when you talked about some of the math. Mm-hmm. A lot of the math is statistics and related to actually proving numerically, mathematically, we made a change and we can point to what we did is the reason it changed. It wasn't yeah. just dumb luck. It wasn't just that right. something happened. We made this change and we can show that because of that, this result occurred. And, it's and there so is some that aspect. too. I mean, for a city making a change to be able to turn around, you know, especially if it was a complaint that they're responding to. They're making a change. Then they turn around and say, hey, based on your, you know, insight or suggestion or complaint, we made this positive change and it's resulted in, you know, a 60% decrease in wait time for blah, 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 or whatever it may be. Yeah. Like that seems like an important final step anyway. Yeah. And, and, and not only does that citizen or whoever had that initial complaint benefit, but, but really anyone past that point, because now the, the process has been changed for the good, you know, for the better. Absolutely. Uh, permanently. So, well, Maria and Kat, what other questions do you all have for Chris or for myself? Although, please ask the hard ones to him. I'm not really sure I have a question. It's more, I, I'm really thinking about, and, and, and Chris, because you're in this role, the consultant role. You see it from a different sideline. You see it from the outer edge. Yeah. Sometimes I feel I come to work every day and I'm like, oh, we already need that. Yeah, we need that. And I, I like the idea of having a consultant to look with the different eyes and say, hey, guys, have you thought about these different ways? And also, I assume that you're working with other cities and other areas where you could say, hey, best practices. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I see the value in that. Sometimes it's just a little bit harder to convince upper echelon that mm-hmm. there is value there. So yeah, I don't know I, how you go ahead and say, hey, upper echelon, this is how we do this. You, you know, there's only, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. So there's only so much you can say of, hey, these are improvements that have been made. You know, you can see other cities or other organizations that have done this and and look what was accomplished. And But there there's only so much that you can can show. And it, and it does come down to those leaders, those individuals really kind of making that switch themselves. But it does help. I do like being an outside person sometimes because I do see things that 
a lot of people now when I point them out, a lot of times they're like, oh, that's yes. OK, that's obvious. But when you're buried in it, it's it's hard to kind of lift your head up and, and see it. And, and I get a vantage point that's different where I can I'm talking to 10 different people and piecing something together and saying, all right, well, now let's come together. And, you know, you were saying this and you were saying this and, and look how together, you know, here's how we're creating this problem and here's what's happening. And you didn't realize you, you know, we're making it more difficult for the other side of the house or, or whatever the, the, the case happens to be. And having that outside perspective does, does help from that standpoint. But I'm a, where, where I kind of draw the line on that is I don't want a city to ever become dependent on me to make stuff happen. And that's where I'm a big advocate of building capacity at the organization, mentoring the people at the organization so that they develop that ability to be because if I'm in one process and I go to another process in the organization, I'm external to that. I'm just the same as being a consultant, right? And I need them to think that way. So a lot of times when I'm mentoring these these folks that have gone through some of the training and are, and are kind of trying to be project management professionals, we call them yellow belts, green belts, black belts within Six Sigma. But anyway, they want to be those that manage those projects and run those projects. I, I also teach them a little bit about consulting of you're now a consultant. Now you're an internal consultant, but you are outside of that group and you have to be able to establish relationships with that group, ask them questions, facilitate their sessions, explain things, listen to them and 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 all that. And so I think that's, I'd, I'd like to pride myself on that being part of what at least I add that makes it a little different with the cities that I've worked with. And Chris and those South Lake and some of the others that I've worked with where I've done a lot of that it seems to have really gotten some good roots and, and paid okay. off now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered, you know, you was more a comment. Oh, so, you, yeah. You, now I can see how we position it because my, my clients are the business units inside the airport mm -hmm. uh, and they are experts in their field. They're subject matter experts in their business unit. And you're right. I'm coming in as an outsider, but I need to ensure that my, that I'm validated and there's a reason for me to be there. And we try and, we try and make sure that we deliver something of value, yeah. uh, but learning best practice of what other people have done from other cities is extremely valuable to me. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. That was great and helpful and informational. And thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.